Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Shati Vishash from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the module Delhi Sultanate, Agriculture and the Rural Class from the paper Economic History of India from the earliest period to 1707. To start with, we have to understand that in this module we have we are going to know we are going to probe into the sources for history of agriculture during Sali Sultanate, changes in the agrarian production during this period, the introduction to new crops, change in the relationship of the peasants with rural aristocracy and imperial power, and in the change in the terms of the rural aristocracy. In case of agriculture, Primarily, we have to understand that uh, agriculture flourished during the period of Delhi Sultanate for various number of reasons. The first was the technological advancement that came with the advent of the Turks. The technology from the West came to India to promote uh, different changes in the modes of production. Secondly, the forest, extensive forest clearing, exposed the cultivable lands to the peasantry. And this fertile land was then used by the peasants for various agricultural products. Improvement in tools with the use of more iron, improvement in irrigation, and extensive use of fertilizers and introduction to new crops paved the way for agricultural improvement. The agricultural produce could easily now go to the market and this surplus production enhanced the non-agrarian production of the time. Land was supposedly abundant in the 12th and 13th century. It is believed that the Ganga Jamuna Dwab was still not clear during this time. So extensive land of this area was being exposed and India was get, getting introduced to new modes of fertile land. Fawad al Fuad refers that between Badaun and Delhi, tigers could harass common man in the 12th century. Later in the 14th century, the sources say that these areas were extensively under cultivation. If Ziauddin Barani is to be believed that in the 14th century, the peasants could even take refuge, refuge in the Dwab region to escape from the atrocities of the state. In the 16th century though, land track was under cultivation according to Moreland. So within 300 to 400 years, what we see is the whole of North India and a large tract was brought under cultivation. Now discussing the peasants and the, their abode, the villages. Nizami in 1354 writes that a peasant needed to start his profession by possessing seeds, a pair of oxen, tools and implements. He does not ever mention land. It is believed that since land was abundant, it was a commodity that could be used by anyone who could possess a pair of oxen, seeds, tools and implements. So getting inducted into the peasantry was an easy task if, it is to, if the sources is to be believed. Villages were fairly self-sufficient and each village approximately comprised 200 to 300 families. The land holding of course differed uh, from peasant to peasant, the upper echelon of the peasantry had large holdings, that is the Khots and the Mukaddams, who were the headmen, had large holdings, while the Balahars or the common man will have smaller holdings. There was a huge landless population. The reason of this was the class-based society where the class discrimination did not allow the menial classes to acquire land. So they mostly worked in the lands of the others though there was enough and abundant land that could have been used. The tools used by the peasants perhaps were all the most same 
that was used in the 19th century. It is only that the iron was different because during uh, the medieval period, the use of iron was left less and thus the implements were a little softer compared to the implements used during the 19th century. A large change did happen in case of irrigation. Now, irrigation paved the way for the land to produce crops in two seasons. So, this is for the first time that the irrigated lands could produce land, produce products for two seasons. Well was a major source of irrigation. The use of dam was also prevalent in some parts of the country. In the 14th century, canals became very popular in certain parts of North India. But this whole use of canal actually, the tradition came from Central Asia with the Turks. According to Barani, canals were first taken up as a royal project during Yasudin Toglak. Later, during Firoz Toglak, on a large scale, canals were dug. Firoz Tola constructed two famous canals, Rajabwa and Ulukhani, carrying water from Yamuna River to the area of Hisar. The third canal carried water from Satlij and the fourth carried water from the Ghagar. The fifth canal carried water from the Kali River to, to with Yamuna and it connected Delhi with rest of North India. According to Sirajus Safif, Hisar with the irrigated water could cultivate rabi and the kharif crop that is summer and winter crops. If Sirajus Afif is to be believed, then Hisar, the area of Hisar was irrigated by water and could cultivate the rabi and the kharif crops that is the summer and the winter crops. It is to be believed that the peasants, the same peasants uh, sowed these crops. Local people could also build canals in the Multan. So the sources say that these canals were either looked after by the local people and with some help from the royal houses. Water was raised in various methods during this time. In ancient times, we do hear the reference to Aragotto, which is a kind of a pin drum system. This pin drum system was later worked by animals. This system was referred also by Babur in his Babur Nama. Persian wheels came much later, but it revolutionized the irrigation system. Now coming to the crops in agriculture, the information regarding it is very, very scanty and scattered, and there is no way to uh, verify them. But it is also true that there were abundance of crops, and the per head consumption was satisfactory. It is believed that the per head consumption during medieval period somewhat increased. Ibn Battuta. Uh, writes that there were large number of crops grown around Delhi during this period. Some lands produce crops in two seasons according to him and this may be true in case of a small portion of land. Most of the land which was not irrigated could not produce these two season crops. There is an interesting record of a merchant named Takera Feru of 1290 who says that there were 25 crops which were grown in and around Delhi. And he also gives the estimates of these crops per month, per bigha. But of course, there is no other source which could verify his account. He mentions that uh, these crops were regularly sown for many years. Now, he of course interestingly excludes indigo and poppy and indigo remained to be even at that time the large export uh, item in agricultural production. It is, it can be said that indigo and poppy was not grown in and around Delhi. Now crops mentioned by Takira Feru also excluded the crops that was introduced in the 16th century namely tobacco, maize, potato, groundnut, chili and tomato. Bali and Jowar, who which were the lower degree 
crops or they'll fetch which fetch less amount of money paved way to wheat and rice in the fertile land later uh, but of course it paved way to wheat and rice of, along with gram and cotton a statistical uh, index from the account of Barani Abul Fazal and 19th century record indicated that the demand of gram and cotton remained the same till 19th century while the demand for barley and jowar declined to a considerable amount now this can be the reason that the standard of living of the people rose and also the taste rose so therefore the consumption pattern altogether changed in india from this time so from a lower de lower rated uh, crop it now moved on to crops like rice and wheat which became the staple instead of barley and jowar even for poor people according to sarajo safif the price of barley and gram was half of that of wheat in the areas of delhi in the 14th century the prices of gram wheat and barley rose as irrigated land produced these crops so we have to understand that crops that were produced in the irrigated land fetched more money for the peasants but it also was cost effective for the peasants from the account of umari and barani one can estimate that the three kharif crops paddy and two pulses that is mash and moth were much underrated during uh, the delhi sultanate p initial years of delhi sultanate but the prices rose in the 16th century the high grade sugar was much pricey in 1310 compared to 16th century that is 1595 the ordinary sugars were, was almost the same price as the wheat uh, but of course we have to understand that common people for common people the consumption of sugar was much less compared to the 16th 17th century account the wheat and sugar cane produced in the irrigated land during alauddin khalji fetched more price compared to the other crops produced in non irrigated land the kharif crop thus was less expensive the hardier rabi crops like gram and barley fetched low prices because they did not use the irrigated water india also boasted at that point time about the wasteland and the cattle <coughs> wasteland was large adjoining to every village it is believed that some of the villages could have 20 to 30 kharak pasture lands or uh, wastelands so he also sirajus afif mentions two villages in hisar which almost had 50 to 40 kharaks or cattlemen the arabic work masalik al absar refers that cattle was available in large quantity uh, in low and it was low priced bullocks were used for carrying goods mostly because that was cheaper mode of transport compared to use compared to the use of cart production and sale of ghee was lucrative and it is believed that some of the multan uh, multan uh, merchants could even afford to have 30 to 40 slaves in by just selling this product this was also a time which saw sericulture in india earlier silk came from china through persia and silk products were made in different parts now this is for the first time that the mulberry silk worms were reared in india and in 14th and 15th century india boasted to have produced pure silk earlier coarser silks like eri muga was produced but of course the production of it was also very limited to regional and it had regional patterns Ibn Battuta does not mention the production of silk in Bengal among other producers in the mid 14th century. 
Now, in the 15th century, that is precisely in 1432, Chinese navigator Ma Huan mentioned extensively the use of of silk in Bengal and large production of silk. Evidence of silk production is found in the work of Tariki Rashidi also, which was completed in the 16th century. Therefore, with this introduction of pure silk, it can be said that India became and was becoming a part of the international silk market. Now, in case of fruit production also, this period saw a revolutionary change. According to Ibn Battuta, mango was the major fruit produced and fetched maximum price. But this mango was definitely the seed grown mangoes and not the other variety. Grape production was earlier very rare but with the initiative of the Toglaks, grape and grapevine became a primary produce in case of fruit production. Uh, and Mohammed bin Toglak, it is believed that he also initiated the production of dates. Agricultural produce increased, therefore, during Delhi Sultanate, along with much variation in the produced. The standard of life due to this improved through, but though of course the burden of tax was very high. The condition of the landless menial class definitely remained miserable due to the caste stratification of the society. Overall, the period is marked by reclamation of cultivable land, extensive irrigation system and introduction of new crops and techniques. This laid the foundation of the economy which could sustain two empires back to back and paved the way for the nanogradient produ produce with further strengthening of the economy. Now let's move to the rural class. Now who exactly was part of this agricultural produce. It is difficult to very difficult to get a clear idea about the agrarian relations during this period from the sources as the sources give you give us fragmentary information and the relation remained almost the same in the lower run. The peasant could not claim any property right. Land was abundant and thus the fear of not possessing a piece of land was still not there. The peasants feared the claim of the class above them who could gra grab the large portion of the product on the basis of the caste structure and the prevailing political system. The peasants were a kind of a bonded labor. There were instances of peasants fleeing villages due to the extortion of the Maliks or the overlords. The peasants were definitely uh, very close to what we call semi-serfs. Like serfs, they could possess seeds, cattle and tools, but they did not have any right over the land. They had the right to sell their produce if they had to pay the revenue in cash. Now coming to the uh, control of the peasantry. Mostly the peasants were controlled by the traditional heads of the villages. Now these traditional heads were referred as Khots and Fukaddams. If Barani is to be believed, then these Khots and Mokaddams were the large peasants with very big holdings within the village. The term Khot was widely used and remained in vogue in Gujarat and Deccan long after 16th century. Before Alauddin Khalji's order, which brought the courts almost to their knees, courts were exempted from paying land tax or kharaz e zizia, house tax or gharai, and the cattle tax or charai. They even insisted on a tax on their own known as Kismati Khoti on the peasants. Now this Kismati Khoti was an arbitrary tax. Alauddin Khalji through his uh, ordinances curbed the powers of the courts by declaring 
this arbitrary tax or kismati khoti as illeg illegal and punishable. He insisted that the courts, as like any other peasants, would pay kharaj and land or land tax at the same rate. House tax, charai, and the cattle tax of of Tharai became compulsory for all the peasants, including the courts during this time. Barani again states that the courts became so poor that no traces of gold and silver remained in the houses and even their women had to go to the households for work. The stern measures were repealed by Ghyasuddin Tokluk, but of course he did not bring back any arbitrary taxes like Ismati Khoti, but of course they were exempted from giving Kharaj, Charai and Gharai. So therefore it can be said that Khots were like uh, the, the peasants who were in the periphery of the aristocracy and their fate solely dependent on the power of the center. If the center of the power, center was very stern, they would be turned into an ordinary peasant and if they were left on their own, they could even become the aristocrats of the villages. Suraj Afif refers that peasants on a whole were wealthy with ornaments, utensils and grains. Of course, we have to understand that he was referring to the middle strata of the peasants and not the manual classes. And this middle strata or the upper strata of the peasantry was few in number and it did not consider the larger section of the peasants. He also refers interestingly of peasants wearing clean clothes, which slept on bedsteads and with white linen. But of course, we can understand that this was not the situation for the ordinary peasants who were always burdened under very heavy taxes. Probably, you have, have to understand that a, ref, a person like Siraj Afif would only be exposed to the life of the middle strata of the peasantry or the above peasantry. Now, the prevailing caste system of the villages would not, would not have been very congenial for the society to give any kind of social lift to the peasants in the lower rung. So, in spite of the fact that production increased, the surplus of agriculture increased, and the standard of the peasants to some extent changed, but they could not move up to the, uh, to, to the upper echelon of the society. Now moving on from the peasantry and the, and the immediate heads, we move to the rural aristocracy. Rural aristocracy was again not uniform and it varied according to the region. The chief who resisted the Ghorians uh, in the sources are terms as Rais and Ranas by Minhas or Siraj. But of course, we have to understand that the, these terms were essentially North Indian. There is also a reference to Rawats, who were the cavalries of the Rais and Ranas. Ziauddin Barani refers to these terms while referring to the events of the 13th century. So we have to understand that both in 12th and 13th century, these terms and these people were in vogue. Now, Barani also refers that this group of aristocracy maintained pirates or foot soldiers and dhanuks or cavalry. So we have to understand that the older aristocracy did not change form immediately after the takeover by the Delhi Sultanate and they were in a position to maintain their own soldiers. In spite of this, he says that there, they did not resist the Delhi Sultans in any way. So the Rawats were the, considered to be the lower position of the Rais and Ranas and Rais and Ranas to some extent were acceptable to the fact that the Delhi Sultans were taking over the centers. The epigraphic sources also use the term Raja, Ranaka or Rauta but these are the terms which was not variedly used in every part of the land. The Delhi Sultanate, after annexing an area, initially gave the area away to the existing hierarchy in lieu of the tribute. 
immediately this process did not alter the relationship of the existing aristocracy with the peasantry. The inscription of 13th century in the region of Jaunpur and Kasrak or Shah Jahanpur reveals that the Ranas and Rais mentioned the Delhi Sultan as their overlords. But in spite of it, their position was not altered. The conquest therefore initially did not create much change as far as social hierarchy is concerned and avoided social commotions. And this was also convenient for the center because at that way they could be they were able to grab hold of the surplus that was increasing in manifold. Even after the replacement of these tributes, the land taxes, the upper echelon of the aristocracy enjoyed much of their early importance because of the caste system. The peasants practically therefore had two heads, one appointed by the Sultan as the governor and the other, the traditional head, the Ranas, who on behalf of the center or governor would collect tax. In case the Rana was unable to collect the tax, the governor would enforce his force to collect this tax. So therefore, practically, now instead of a one uh, overlord, the peasants actually had two overlords. Thus the position of the Rais and Ranas, one can say, were reduced but not abolished. And Rais and Ranas had direct contact with the village headman or the Chaudhary, a term which was now in vogue. Now, coming to the term Chaudhary, which was used even during the British period, the 14th century records say the process of abolition of the rural aristocracy was completed and then a new one was replaced. This transformation definitely was smooth because we do not hear about large scale social upheaval. The center did not much bother as long as the revenue amount was not reduced. The new class was absorbed from the older ones. It is believed that the Chaudhrys were this new set in the new class. The intermediary class was such essential for the center for the collection of land revenue in this time because they did not have and did not have the requisite amount of people to have collect the taxes directly. The 13th century account of Minhasu Siraj or any other Persian sources does not use the term Chaudhary. Barani uses this term in the mid 14th century for the first time but in several references. Ibn Battuta later explicitly refers that the territories were divided into villages or sadis and the Chaudhrys were in charge of these sadis and an official named Mutasarif collected taxes on his behalf. So the concept of revenue system, a direct rev uniform revenue system was in vogue from this time. Now coming to the concept of sadis or parganas, Ibn Battuta's reference to collect the villages as sadis and thousands of villages as hazara is very ambiguous. It can be that he was referring to his own homeland and trying to set things in India. No other contemporary sources refer to these terms of hazara or sadis. By 14th century, a collection of villages came to be known as Parganas and referred in most of the documents. The concept of Pargana continued even during the time of the Mughals and later during the British period. The term Pargana, uh, of course, is not mentioned by Barani, but Moorland youths notes that this was a term that was used both by Siraj Zafif and Isami. The term came to use during the years of Muhammad bin Toglak and was not frequently used before that. By 16th and 17th century, the term Chaudhary indicated the hereditary zamindar or the landlord who was responsible for the collection of land taxes in Pargana.
The Sadi may have been the other term for Pargana and since Ibn Battuta was familiar with the earlier term, he used it for his own convenience. It is believed that the Ranas were same as the Chaudhuris. But of course, this is very difficult to ascertain. All these informations come from fragmentary, fragmentary sources and cannot therefore be corroborated with each other. In another account of Maharu, uh, he refers to the term uh, ambiguously, but of course uh, it is not very clear whether the term could have been used during his time. Maharu claims that the peasants paid taxes only when they were forced. Therefore, the tendency of tax evasion was always true, but the reason can be the taxes in, in this part of the land was always very high and irrational. In 1353 AD, Ferox Thoglak went to Bengal's expedition. He used terms like Maliks, Mukaddams, Mafrozis as Zamindas if Mafru, uh, Maharu is to be believed. In the middle of the 14th century, the land revenue system divided the subjects into two groups, the peasants, that is the Dahakins and the Zamindars. The term Zamindar henceforth was the blanket term for all rural aristocracy. Now this term was also in vogue during the time of the Mughals and the British. Mafrozis were state appointed heads in place of the earlier headmen. Mukaddams definitely were the same status as that of the Khots and Malik was a term used generally for any superior class collecting the taxes. The term Zamindar was a blanket term as we have understood during the Sultanate period and it initiated to create a uniform land tax system with regional very little regional variation. Thus, there can be a possibility that the term like Zavindar was becoming a uniform term with uniform power. The 15th century situation altered and the independent unit of Delhi Sultanate were restricted to certain areas that there is a possibility that older aristocracy revived their positions. Thus, the Kokars of Punjab, the Khanazads of Mewar and the chief of Gwalior and Katihar became powerful again. Interestingly, records say that in certain parts of Bihar during Sikandar Lodi, there were two sets of village, one head held by the peasants and the other headed by the Mukaddams, while the other was in control of the Zavindar. The successor of Sher Shah rebuked the rural aristocrats and complained that they did not pay their own tax and exploited the peasants to a greater extent. So therefore, the tussle between the center, the middlemen and the peasantry always remained the same and the tension could never have been solved. Thus, it can be concluded that the rural aristocracy enjoyed hereditary rights on the basis of it was able to control the peasantry. After due payment to the centre, they could arbitrarily collect tax if the vigil of the centre was weakened. The centre, though, did not directly control the social life of the villages and thus the existing caste system always gave an edge to the rural aristocracy. So if we have to conclude this model, we have to understand that agriculture flourished during the time of Delhi Sultanate for various reasons. The agrarian surplus gave the boost for the non-agrarian production. The agrarian surplus also changed the standard of life of the masses. The agrarian relations also changed slowly with new overlords without much commotion in the social strata and the changes paved the way for expansion of the Delhi Sultanate and paved the way for the Mughal Empire in the next century. Thank you.